Okay, so I'll just say right now for the next couple, you're probably going to see Rob in these because the power went out in my house. <laughs> and again, the, these are shot early, so by the time you see this, you'll probably know the Nostalgia Critic was late. It was the Lord of the Rings one. So we're just like uh, filming three of these in a row. Yeah, we're, we're just doing a couple of these in a row. I'm like, you know, the power just came on, but I'm still importing the footage of Lord <laughs> of the Rings. I so. love this season. I will, too, like, I will totally try to get in in as many episodes of this season as possible. Yeah, so I mean, so for the next year, we're just running through avatars right now while I'm importing the Lord of the Rings footage. So, um, uh, with that said, we have The Headband. Okay, kind of a weird title, the more I think about it. Um, it was the name of my first garage band. <laughs> which is very obviously Footloose. <laughs> I think that would be a better Oh, I see. So if I say it's like Star Wars, you're like, oh, but it's its own thing. It's its own thing. No, this, like, is, this clearly is clearly Footloose. Footloose. Oh, okay. This is clearly Footloose. <laughs> but um, with... Firebending. I mean, it's it's a lot smarter than Footloose. I, I don't care. Yeah, what do you got against Footloose? Oh, Footloose is fucking stupid. <laughs> and, and yeah, so, but the kids love it. I mean, right down to the 80s sound effects. Though, I mean, even though that's more Speed Racer here, but um, okay, I'm gonna go with Inspector Gadget. Okay, it's like we just get rid of the wah wah in the first season, but now you we're bringing no back respect. all the Inspector Gadget. Yeah, just the. I'm like, come. I, I, I fucking hate that shit. No respect I know it's the for style. the style. I know it's the style. I just fucking hate it. It's I, so annoying. The more classic 80s sound effects you can get how, in any cartoon, the better. How much funnier Don't would it be without those dumbass sound effects? I just and I know it's the thing. I know that's the anime style. Oh. I know that's just how it works. It just drives me nuts. Oh, oh Doug. So, but oh, Doug. Okay, okay. So, so we have this episode called the Headband, which is actually, again. I, if you were to tell me where do you think this season was going to go, where do you think the next episode's going to go, I would not have predicted that. And it's actually a pretty clever turn. Uh, because if, at first you you don't suspect, you wouldn't expect that was going to happen, but then on top of that, it's actually kind of a smart move, because as he says, he's actually finding out about the Fire Nation. He's and basically hiding right out in the open, which yeah. I love. So, <laughs> I, and I love the, the idea of a 112-year-old um, kid who has all of these superpowers just sitting around in school and like my favorite line is like, oh, you must be one of those popular kids. <laughs> I've heard so like, much about. <laughs> I've heard so much about. Just like, it's like nothing phases him. It's like the kid tries to kick his ass and Aang's like, okay. Like, you know, he just dodges a bin because he knows like he could totally kill this guy in an instant. And again, I, I like those instances where you have someone who's really kind, really nice, it, kind of a pacifist. I mean, he will fight when he needs to, but you know, will try to avoid violence and he's actually becoming more popular than the really tough, violent kids because he's just smarter. And he didn't fight him nice. either. He just dodged him. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. I love how that can actually get him more friends and make him more popular, you know, by just being really smart and doing his own thing. Um, it, it, for the most part, it's it's a good episode. I, I got to sit through some of that stuff where, again, I kind of go, oh, that's... That's for the kids, okay. Like Sokka and Katara dressing up like the parents. Oh, come on, that was having the, dance, having the dance at the end. I'm like, come on, is this like prom night now? I mean, this is straight up Footloose. And then the grown ones come in and say, I'm most unorthodox and stuff. But it's, I mean, it's done well enough. I mean, it works well enough, not quite to the point where I'm like, this is unbelievably stupid. But at the same time, I'm going... This is kind of lame. <laughs> it's for it's... ten year olds. I know, and it's, it's a good like... two hours shorter than Happy Feet. <laughs> <laughs> this did it in twenty four minutes. It's economical, <laughs> but you did. I I don't know. It, it's good to have an episode like this because again, it's nice to see Ang come in and he teaches these kids who are not allowed to have much of a childhood. He gives them a little bit of a childhood, and, and he allows them to rebel a little bit too you know, at a point where kids need to rebel, and it, it's important, and that's why I think the episode does work. It, it's just, again, you have to sort of sit through this stuff like, oh, we're doing that, huh? Okay, oh, that cliche, all right, well, it's I think not there's, long. I think there's more going on in this episode than you're giving it credit for. I mean, it's it's good, and, and it works. Um, and uh, honestly, it, I, I don't know what I would fix if I had to go in and, and fix it. It's sort of like I acknowledge it kind of about? Needs, <laughs> No, I acknowledge it needs to be here. It's... <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what I think about it. The stuff with Zuko is good. <laughs> it's still really good. Uh, not so surprisingly, Uncle Iro doesn't talk that much. Um, <laughs> I, honestly, I, it, it is funny because in retrospect now, because we know what happened to Mako, it makes sense, but... 
It's a really brilliant move. It, it, re it still really works. It, it really works as a story that he would give him the silent treatment. It's horrible to and say, it but... Also, it also gives you a buffer zone so that you have a few episodes to not listen to Mako's original voice. That way you're not going to be like, whoa, what the hell? Totally different. Because <laughs> the guy that got to replace him, he was somebody I think who was doing bit roles in the show already, does a really good impression. It's actually, like, really good. I haven't heard it yet, but... Um, you actually, you probably have. I'm almost positive because Mako died in somewhere near the end of the second okay, season. Okay, so he that. did a few pickups before. I'm almost positive this guy did a few pickups. There's a lot of times in the second really close, season, I'm like... But it's still just slightly different enough, because how, how do you get a voice like Mako's? It's just, yeah, th you know, There's it's, a lot of times where I was saying that... You know, either he was sick or in a different mood or had yeah. cold or something, or this is a different voice actor. Yeah. But it, I mean, all, all the time, it's just still bought enough fine, though, because, because you just can't replicate uh, a 60 something year old Japanese man. But I mean, it's, you know, it, it's just different enough that by giving you that gap, you'll forget, particularly if you're watching this weekly. I mean, we're watching it daily. Yeah. Um, or I've watched it daily now. Um, it gives you enough of a gap that you kind of forgot exactly how his voice sounds, so you don't flip out. It's horrible to and say, it's but a really good impression of, on top of that. Mako so. kind of died at just the right time <laughs> in terms of this show because you have, you know, Zuko. If you're going to him. die, and we never want to see yeah, that happen, yeah, of course happen, we don't. But if I mean, that was going, if that if it's clear that was happening no matter what, and it's fortuitous that it happened when it yes, did. Yes, because he has... And not in the middle of season one or so. Yeah, because Zuko has betrayed his uncle, and his uncle is giving him the silent treatment, and, you know, usually I'm not a fan of the silent treatment, but you kind of understand it here, because the uncle has done everything, has given everything oh, he's pissed. for his nephew and I think he's I, you know what I can a millisecond say, yeah. he he he, he I can't even say pissed he's disappointed I think he's just disappointed to the fact yeah, to the point that he's like there is nothing I can do he, he feels out. like it's his failure as well yeah and <laughs> yeah and Zuko comes asking for more advice and it's like which is still based on capturing the avatar which is what I love which yeah. is why I don't think he'll ever answer him he's like I need your you know I need your help uncle I need your help and he's not answering because because he knows, well, all you want is help capturing Aang, and I, I'm not in. Well, on top of that, I, I think he finally realizes, too, because the uncle would never leave him alone. He, he sort of, he gave him a, his space for a bit, but even then he still followed. Now it's like, no, you need to face this alone. You know, you made your choice. Now you really have to think about what you have and what you're going to do about it, because... Yeah, he's given everything for him. And I think the scene... You're uh, grave, buddy. Dig it. <laughs> and I, I really like that. I really like the moment when, you know, Zuko, he turns around and he leaves. And again, it, like what you say, it doesn't show the anger. It shows the disappointment. After yeah. he leaves, he just has that one tear flow down his face. And honestly, again, that's just as powerful as You made Mako cry. Damn it, Zuko. <laughs> that's just as powerful as anything you could have written for him. So whether or not yeah. it was intentional to have him be quiet originally or they did because he passed, Brilliant uh, one it, it ties in beautifully. So, um, yeah, no, that, that, I thought it was very well done. The episode itself, I thought it was really brilliant because this is something you don't see. When you have most cartoon shows with an enemy. Yeah, they try to make they you give the enemy. You don't in. get to see children on the other side. You don't get to see their daily lives. You don't get to see the fact that they're being indoctrinated Sorry. with <laughs> cell phone calls interrupting my great speech. <laughs> I'm listening. Are you finished? I'm finished. Continue. Anyway. Um, yeah, you don't get to see these things. I mean, there's a great lesson here about basically understanding the other, the person that you're calling an enemy. And what Aang's learning, he's like, these kids are exactly like me. In some ways, they're worse off because they're just being fed this horse shit, <laughs> you know, from a very early age, and they can't dance, they can't have any sort of sense of fun, they're trained to just worship the state, you know, and Sokka and Katara have such a hatred for the Fire Nation. I mean, in her case, that's played out even more in later episodes. But Sokka, too, he's always like, you know, those fire-breathing monsters, those, 
you know, and I think Aang's proving a very important point. He's like, they're not monsters at all, you know, they're just kids. They're being trained well, to be they, monsters. They play with this a little bit in that Jet episode where they're going to, they're going to break the dam, they're going to drown uh, that neighborhood full of, I mean, no soldiers, just families of the Fire Nation, and they stand up and said, no, this is not right. The, these people have done nothing. These are people just trying to live their lives. But I agree, we haven't, ac <clears throat> we haven't actually gone into a point where we just see the kids of the Fire Nation, you know? Sometimes we'll see a family here or there, or like a fair or something, but this is specifically and not the, just kids, the kids, and they're like any other kids. How the Fire Nation comes to be. You know, I mean, the, yeah, the, how the, the right. lesson is very clear, is that these kids all start out normal, and then basically go through boarding school hell, and come out these nationalistic, <laughs> jingoistic, fire-tossing maniacs, mm -hmm. you know? Which is what Soka's always saying. Um, so... I thought that was really great. The dance thing's kind of silly, but I mean, they, they admit that. I think one of them says in the beginning, that just sounds, I think it was Soka, that just sounds silly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, but I think it's also proving a point, which is so much of what, and this comes into play later, so much of what Aang is being instructed to do is basically kill the Fire Lord, take out the Fire Nation, this and that, and he's figuring out, well, maybe there's another way. You know, maybe I can plant the seeds, you know, of revolution in these kids. Maybe if they can just learn to cut loose a little, you know, maybe something will spread. Maybe it won't. I, th there but. is, and stuff like this is important because a mistake that so many people make, especially when they're emotional, I, you know, and I make it too, and I, I know you make it too, but we've all made it, is that, you know, outside of just, like, necessarily a prejudice or something, when you look at a group of people... Like, you know, oh, people who like this or people that like that, they're all this. Well, they say they want this, but really they want that. When you get down to it, you, there's no way to properly capture that because it's always going to be nothing but a ton of people with a ton of different opinions and there may be patterns, but they're still individual people. And when you say one group wants this, one group wants that one, it, you can't ever sum up exactly what one group is is because it's always going to be a ton of different people and it's hard to sum up even what one person is so episodes like this i think are very very important because as you said it doesn't I, just this place is one, of the most one group and they episodes. are all yeah, one this thing. is one of the most important episodes <clears throat> in the season and that's why i mean it, you know we can joke about me like oh it's just footloose and like but it, you get past that one point and there's a whole whole ton of stuff going on. I know, I, I wish... And it gives you a history of the fire. And, and, and I know and I know it needs to be silly, and I get that. I wish it could have been... I wish it could have been more silly like some of the other episodes have been silly. Like, there's a... There's a funnier silly in there somewhere, and then maybe a touch more of a clever silly. But, but this is a... This is still a good silly. <laughs> you know, the other interesting thing it does is... It gives us a sense of Fire Nation culture, which I didn't mention in the last episode, but... One thing I noticed, and I could be wrong about this, but it seems like the show is drawing on four kind of specific cultures for each of the elements. Um, you know, waterbending to me is very Inuit, Eskimo, um, Siberian sort of shaman base, you know, the north. Um, the airbenders seem very Tibetan Buddhist, Buddhist to me, maybe yeah. Shaolin monks. Um, the Earth Kingdom to me, I didn't mention this in the last episode, but it's very Chinese to me. Like right down to the bureaucracy that's trying to keep everything secret. <laughs> you know, that just strikes me as just being very sort of Chinese in nature, the well, design, again, the size the, of it, the fact the that it's right dress. in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, the Fire Nation, I mean, maybe I'm wrong in this. Whenever I look at them, and particularly the indoctrination, um, Japanese, like when I look at it with their Navy and the whole indoctrination the honor, aspect the focus of, on yeah, honor. and the aspect of the schools remind me of you know what was going on basically like in in fascist japan you know the the 30s and you know and let's all emphasize these kids. we like the japanese oh no i love the no problem <laughs> with the japanese it's at part, all yeah no it's a part of history that happened though and i think they're actually kind of referencing that i mean well, what nation has not had a dark time you know in their history so but i mean they're all drawing from certain time periods and certain and like i think they're they're trying to correlate you know what the Fire Nation is doing with what pre-war or World War II Japan was looking like, you know, where you had all of these kids being, you know, taught things like for the good of the state, you know, and I mean the, the Germans were doing the same thing, but this is an I was gonna say, th this seems sort of like a Japanese, but sort of emphasis on, yeah. like, Nazi Germany, honestly, I mean, it's, I, I'm, like, again, I'm sure even Japan, the darkest stages, have gone through something similar, but it's like, I, I read a lot of Nazi-ism uh, in Well, they were doing the same thing, it was all about 
the state is the highest honor you have to serve your country, you know. I, I mean, look at it. I mean, we, to some extent, were doing some of it, too. You look at the propaganda we had at the time. You know, oh, sure, spooky. yeah. Um, so I, it just seems to be drawing a connection. I said Japanese because it... The Navy they have, the fact that they seem to be, I mean, you could argue that a lot of them are island nations, but that in particular, it seems to be an island nation with a very modern Navy, everything sort of technology. It I, just I reminds me of that era in history and the fact that it's an Asian culture. So, and I, I, I get much more the, the color red. Uh, right? You know, because I also think that, like, you know, the other thing I think very much is sort of like, it sounds weird, but like Klingon. I think we sort of agree too that Klingon is very much. Very Japanese too, because there's a sort of emphasis. Bushido sort of code of the samurai. Guy. Yeah, I mean, ju just that emphasis on honor that seems to be a um, big part. You know, Zuko is not going back for power; he's going back for honor. And he now he has the power and, and the honor, but he he feels like he doesn't have the honor. Something still yeah. missing. I'm not saying it's modern Japanese. I'm just saying, yeah. but it, it's tapping into those you know sort of cultures we've had throughout history, and they all seem Asian-based to me well, and he, in here's, this world. It's, you know, so that's why I tend to think of Japan. Here, here's something else. Of history, yeah. Here's something else I think is very important uh, that I think they're playing out, with the exception of maybe the Air Kingdom, because we haven't quite seen enough of them, uh, especially because they're essentially gone. are really going to. <laughs> uh, well, well, essentially because they're gone now, too. They're practically extinct. Is that all the nations they've shown these large problems with these nations, with the, uh, you know, with the water bank nation, you sort of get this, that they are kind of sexist, they won't train women, it's, uh, men, women, and th those are the only two places, you know, and then they're, now that we get wiggle room there, with the Earth, na Earth nations, the cover-ups, and uh, the government controlling everything without you even realizing it, and the secrecy, and of course, with the fire nation, you know, finally, the militarism, yeah, the militarism, and uh, uh, just going too far, so it's one of those things where I do wonder if they focused at one point more on what the, uh, uh, the air nation, or the wind nation, or whatever it's called, I think uh, the air nation about... Uh, may, I, maybe we will have seen the flaws there, too. I, I think it's implied, actually. Um, generally looking at it, it seems implied to me that the Air Nation is sort of um, hermit-like. Yeah, we did get that when yeah. they were going to take him away from his uh, from his friends and everything, because and they would not let him be a kid. I mean, which is very debatable whether or not that was you the know, right I choice. Think I think the problem away. is, and this is a criticism of... Uh, of certain sects of Buddhism or Indian uh, Hindi philosophy, which is the concept of withdrawing from the world. Like, that is that is a criticism sometimes levied against that sort of, um, you know, basically those philosophies or religions. And, 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 when, and I, think, I think that's definitely something that you could argue that may be their fatal flaw, because they're withdrawing from the world, they are pacifistic, they seem very agrarian, not that much into technology, and... They get their asses handed to them. Oh, no, on, on top uh, of that, that episode where one of the temples is taken over by the uh, whatever the, the inventor and those people and stuff, and Aang is really like, "What is going on here? No, not cool." And he he has to be taught that these people need to survive as well. And it's sort of this was the original ideology that maybe they were starting to sort of turn against too. So you're right, sort of cutting yourself away from the world. You're cutting yourself away from people and helping people sometimes. You know, as and well, there too. may be cause since. This show's drawing so much from Asian history, and it, there may be a correlation there, you know, between, you have the argument, you know, between the Chinese and the Tibetan Buddhists, you know, the Chinese sort of rolled right in, and now all of the Tibetan Buddhists are either living under Chinese rule or spread out in exile, you know, perhaps like what could have happened to the Air Kingdom. I don't know if that's intentional or not, uh, you know, but you could probably make that argument. Uh, bottom line, what, what I do like is that... Uh, Essentially what the show is coming yeah. down to, too, is that there's not one evil, like, if you're on this no. side, evil! Uh, no. These are still people, these are still humans, it's when things are thrown out of balance uh, through one way or another, or people wanting more or uh, wanting less or whatever, and that's essentially what Aang is trying to do, he's trying to bring back the balance. And it's not a simple good versus evil. Yeah. And it, it shows there is more you it. those cultures. It, it, it does. doesn't just say they're the enemy, or even if it's like we're gonna make peace with the enemy, this whole it makes episode it all human. gave you a culture to attach yourself to a culture that you're going to explore more in the yeah in the rest of the series and it makes them human. Mm -hmm. I don't see that a lot in cartoons. It drives me nuts. No, uh, but adult films. We help. don't know what's going on with those stormtroopers. They may have perfectly nice family lives. But, I mean, I, I mean, I, I guarantee, like, Death Star uh, blows up and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guarantee most of the summer films you'll see here they're PG-13 or R. 
I mean, they're not going to go nearly into as much Couldn't humanity. Give a crap. It, well, and they're not going to go into nearly as much humanity as this yeah. show is for families. So, yeah, again, I mean, and in my opinion, that actually makes the family show way more adult because it has yeah, the balls exactly. to talk about it. So, and, and it has the time, it has the intelligence, it has the talent. So, I thought it was a great episode. Uh, Fuck your footloose. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's still. I never said it was bad. I just said that I think you some of the silly elements could have been a little funnier. Um, so yeah, it's still good episode. Enjoy it, and uh, yeah, we'll just see you at the next one.